Welcome to the Seventh Planet Broadcasting Special Series, The Anunnaki. I am your host, Matt LaCroix. Join me as we journey across the ancient world in search of the hidden truth behind who the ancient gods of mankind really were. I am joined by Gerald Clark and Zechariah Lang. Together, we will explore the hidden knowledge and unravel the mysteries left behind in the remains of ancient cultures from all over the world. Are we really alone in the universe? Or has important information been kept secret from the masses that answer the questions to our hidden origins? Could there be a common source from the megalithic ruins in the jungles of Mesa America to the great Egyptian Giza pyramid? Were the Anunnaki possibly the missing creators of these advanced cultures, hidden by the sands of time, jungles, and the editorial records inked by warring conquistadors? Sumer is one of the earliest civilizations dating back to 3800 BC. It is often referred to as the cradle of civilization. The Sumerians are credited with having the first known writing system, advanced architecture, agriculture, mathematics, and astronomy, all of which they attributed to these sky gods. Ancient Sumerian people called them the Anunnaki, which means those who from Anu were sent to Ki, our earth. The Enuma Elish, the Babylonian epic of creation, are clay tablets that tell the story of the formation of earth out of the bowels of Tiamut. To understand who the Anunnaki are, we must first understand our planet's origins. Our solar system originally contained a great sun until an invader solar system became trapped within its gravitational field. Our sun acquired a binary twin, which is the case for about 80% of other known solar systems. The Enuma Elish cuneiform tablets describe the great celestial battle that this invader solar system caused as its retrograde motion caused collisions with other planetary bodies. A large planet with several moons, known by the gods as Marduk, Nibiru, or Planet X, became trapped in our sun's electromagnetic and gravitational field. Sumerian tablets like the Enuma Elish describe their gods coming from an extraterrestrial planet, home of the Anunnaki. The planet of crossing has a long elliptical orbit of 3,600 years, or a SAR. The Nibiru complex is difficult to detect due to its highly inclined orbital path position relative to the sun. Could the Sumerian description of the Anunnaki home planet truly traverse an orbital path into solar perihelion, cyclically as the cuneiform tablets claim? One such collision was Tiamut with a satellite of Nibiru. This formed what we know of as Earth. A satellite of Nibiru, known as Kingu, became trapped by the Earth's gravitational field and became our moon. Could this explain why our moon is abnormally large in comparison to the size ratio of other planets and their satellites in our solar system? The Enuma Elish describes a planetary collision that created a massive debris field, a hammered bracelet which we term the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Each Nibiru perihelion crossing has the potential to spawn Earth changes which may include earthquakes, volcanism, extreme weather, and sometimes extinction level events depending on Nibiru's position relative to the Earth and the Sun. Earth's subsequent collisions with comets and asteroids, some containing life-giving water and alien seeds, may have caused an unintentional panspermia that led to many of the advanced life forms we see today. Because Nibiru is in retrograde orbit with our planets, each close encounter with the inner great sun could degrade their planet's atmosphere. Desperately seeking a means of protection, the Anunnaki analyzed our solar system's planets, knowing that the shielding properties of transition metals could be used as a radiation shield. In 1990, Sumerologist Zechariah Sitchin, author of The Twelfth Planet, met with Chief of the U.S. Naval Observatory, Dr. Robert Harrington. Maybe uh, you wish to tell us in a 
few minutes the nature of those discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the date on here I was just noticing is um, 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system, and this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing, and that's when you, you sent me this book. You have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some, some, some time aeons ago uh, of, of a, a celestial body which you, I think, named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or, or, or somehow uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escaped satellite of Neptune. This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. We'll take the orbit of the satellite near Reed and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. In the, We've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture at least in your own mind of what we are talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh. Well, if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto, and this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet, and here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet, yes. and uh, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in biblical time, and that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now, and, uh, which is, again, approximately the area that we're looking in. If planet X exists, we are not alone in this solar system. So why did the Anunnaki come to Earth? Did spectroscopic analysis, while in retrograde orbit like a moving observatory, indicate that planet Key had sufficient gold for their purposes? Gold may be one of the most important elements in the universe. That would explain why an advanced civilization would go to great lengths to acquire it. Gold as a metal takes a front row seat when surveying human culture. The precious metal belonged to the Mayan god Quetzalcoatl, but was not used as the basis for currency as it is now all over the world. Gold's resistance to corrosion 
makes it virtually eternal. Even if left sunken at the bottom of the ocean floor for centuries, it remains pure. Today, gold is used in modern space exploration where it lines integrated circuits, astronaut visors, and critical communications equipment. This is the case because gold reflects up to 98% of harmful solar radiation. Gold can also be found in monoatomic form. What is monoatomic gold? Lawrence Gardner in his book, Genesis of the Grail Kings, describes finding a white talcum-like powder beneath a stone in the floor of Hathor's temple on what is now known as Mount Sinai. Based on modern science, when ingested by humans, it transforms the human neurological system into a superconductor. It goes by many names to include the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. The effects purported by the Anunnaki kingly lineage were long life and optimal spiritual energy. The Atrahasis cuneiform tablets explain that Homo sapiens were genetically altered to speed up their evolution so that they could become slaves to mine for the gold deep in the Abzu. The real question is, are we still doing the same thing today? Let's look a little deeper into these forgotten gods of history. So who are these gods of the ancient world? Researchers are often asked, what do the Anunnaki look like? Looking at the various statues portraying the Greek god Poseidon, it seems very clear they look just like us. Genesis 1.26 states, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The Atrahasis predates the canonical Bible by thousands of years describing an Anunnaki council meeting in which both Ninma and Enki were tasked with creating a primitive worker to replace the Ajiji in the mines. Is this not the source of the Biblical Genesis 126? All throughout history, from the Egyptians to the Greeks, we see names representing gods that show striking similarities to one another. To understand their influences upon history, we first have to decipher all the names to see the cross-cultural connections. Many of these names, like Isis or Zeus, are commonly seen even today, but most think they are simply mythology. In digging deeper, you will find that many of these gods had different names given to them in practically every culture examined. As part of an effort to make sense of who all the players were in the Sumerian records, a hand-drawn genealogy table was created. This early family tree evolved into an extensive chronology spanning the prehistory on Nibiru to the 12 tribes of Israel. Between the last God table and this genealogy tree, when seen in relation to each other with their also known as namesakes, could they have actually been on a council together as described? To understand how the Anunnaki council worked, we have to look at their various ranks and where they fit in. Much like we see today within the military and the government, the Anunnaki had their own hierarchical rank system. In this case, Anu held the top number 60. Is it possible that human civilizations simply mimicked their Anunnaki ancestral governing structures, which are still evident here on planet Earth today? As was shown earlier, Anu was depicted as the highest ranking member of the Anunnaki Council of 12 his rank being the sexagesimal base number 60 and king of Nibiru. The Sumerian records speak of Anu's white temple in the city of Uruk, where King Gilgamesh ruled. Documents also describe Anu's trips to Ki, our earth, to settle disputes and divide territory among his offspring previously shown composing the ruling council. Enki and Enlil are sons of Anu, and both feel they're the rightful rulers of Earth. These two brothers have always had tension between them as their views and morals constantly clash. Could it be true that these alien half-brothers used Earth's resources, including mankind, as mere pieces in a chess match? Is it possible that Enki and Enlil are simply actors on a bigger galactic stage playing the dualistic role of creator and destroyer, the architect, of dark and light. Enlil is described as a military commander and lord of the air. 
He is the second born son of Anu with his half sister named Ki Arash. Enlil, heir of the Anunnaki throne, traveled to Earth approximately 5,000 years after Enki. <clears throat> Enlil was known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and is often called Yahweh or Jehovah. What are the historical ramifications that Enlil were also known as the Greek god Zeus? One of the most important influences of mankind seems to come from a being known as Enki. Enki was a scientist, geneticist, and master alchemist. He is known as the genetic father of mankind, or as Ta, or Osiris by the Egyptians, and Poseidon, lord of the sea. Human sensing and perception systems are organized to include nerve ganglia along the spine that have measurable wavelengths coinciding with the colors of the visible light spectrum. Could Enki, the great scientist, have designed what the Hindu culture terms chakras within the human structure for some secret alternative purpose? Could the nature of the chakra system imply that we are designed to become advanced radiant light beings under some particular circumstances, known only to our creators and possibly by the masters of the Far East? The Atrahasis speaks of a birth goddess that was given responsibility to come up with a replacement worker during the Anunnaki Council meeting spawned by the Ajiji Rebellion. She has many names throughout the account to include Ninma, Belit Ili, and Nin Herzog. As the medical officer, she had facilities in the city of Shurupak, the same city where Atrahasis, Noah, was the king, corroborating the biblical Genesis account. We know of her most notorious name from the Egyptians, where she is called Isis. One of the most important continuous creation science teachings encoded in the Egyptian culture is the story of Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Isis was not only the mother of humanity, having carried the first baby to term, but was also a very prominent being in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Ningshida represents a very important figure in our history, for it seems he became mankind's teacher. Ningshida was frequently mentioned in the Enuma Elish, affiliated with the planet Mercury. Ningshida is the second born son of Enki and was highly scientific like his father. It is stated in the Enuma Elish that he helped perform the genetic upgrade to the primitive workers so they could procreate. Ningshida was given the caduceus symbol, which is still commonly seen today in the healthcare industry. In 1945, a collection of important texts was found sealed underground in the Giza Plateau, known as the Nagamati Library. The texts were written by a being known as Enoch, who was the original founder of the pagan religion. The Nag Hammadi scriptures were found deliberately buried beneath the desert sands of Egypt to protect their safekeeping. The Gnostic scriptures inspired by Hermetic writings, along with the Book of Enoch, appear to have common origins. Now that we understand who the major players are, let's look into some of the evidence behind who some of these forgotten gods of mankind are. Sometimes you don't have to go too far to discover it. From the ancient Mesopotamian region, modern day Iraq, we find primitive images on money that portray what look like the Anunnaki gods. Marduk is likely portrayed as Babylon was his chosen city. Perhaps this hidden symbology is all over the world to those who are looking. How tall do you think that seated god would be when standing next to the human on the left? Do we now have evidence showing that our understanding about Egyptian and Sumerian cultures could have been preceded by even earlier high civilizations in Turkey? The ancient sites of Katalhayuk and Gobekli Tepe have been dated accurately to 9,000 to 12,000 years old, respectively. Why does mainstream archaeology tell us that during this time, human beings were primitive and basic? How could primitive people lacking tools have constructed such advanced cities with no outside influence? These are difficult but fundamental questions we have to ask. One of the most important pieces of evidence we have for understanding what really happened in our past is told from the tablets known as the Epic of Atrahasis. 
The Atrahasis story is composed of three Akkadian and Old Babylonian version cuneiform tablets that were dated to circa 1700 BC. The Atrahasis provides details supporting mankind's early creation account by order of the Anunnaki Council as a replacement for the Ajiji miners toiling deep in the Abzu of South Africa. Atrahasis, the king of Sharupak, also known as Zia Sudra and Utnapishtim from the Epic of Gilgamesh, has striking similarities to that of the biblical Noah. Could they all be names for the same person? The ancient Sumerian cities of Mesopotamia have been well documented in cuneiform tablets like the Sumerian King's List, which records their age as well as their extensive time that some of the kings ruled, listing in 3,600 Shar reigns. Important cities like Nippur and Sippar functioned as mission control centers and spaceports or launch sites like we see at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Other cities like Bad Tabira show signs of advanced metallurgy and ore processing. What exactly was going on thousands of years ago in these ancient cities? Let's take a deeper look at just where some of these cities of the gods really were. Arriving in ancient Mesopotamia thousands of years ago, we see that most human civilizations are found along the lower Tigris and Euphrates rivers, close to the mouth of the Persian Gulf. This cradle of civilization was found in what's known as the Fertile Crescent Valley because of the abundance of good soil for growing crops, thanks to the annual floods. Without irrigation techniques, much of this land is arid and difficult to live on. Many of these ancient cities lie crumbling and forgotten in the deserts of Iraq and Syria. Why would so many important archeological sites be so neglected and not uncovered for the rich knowledge they contain? From the city of Babylon to Eridu, it seems most of our earliest civilizations that show strong influences from the gods will remain nearly lost to time, buried below shifting desert sands. Shurupak was sited Ninmah's medical headquarters. The city was ruled by a famous king known as Zia Sudra or Atrahasis. The biblical Noah was also king of the same city of Shurupak when the famous flood came after 600 years as the ruler. This is the same location and time mentioned in the Atrahasis tablets discussing a destructive flood about which the Anunnaki swore an oath not to inform the humans. To the northeast in the Zagros Mountains of Turkey juts high to the heavens the great peak known as Mount Ararat. Archaeologists have uncovered the remnants of a great ship many believe could be Noah's Ark. Could the Sumerian Atrahasis flood story, also ending on Mount Ararat, be the source for the biblical tale involving Noah? The ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur was named the capital of Sumer twice. During the second time, it was ruled by the god known as Nanar Sin, who shows striking similarities to the Islamic god known as Allah. Could they perhaps be the same being? According to the cuneiform text, we were told that Nanar Sin's father, Enlil, destroyed the city with nuclear weapons from previous anger he had for him. If you look deeper into the previous conflicts that occurred, like the rebel uprising in the South African mines, it becomes clear that the long-held grudges seem to remain with these gods. Adding the reigns from the Sumerian kings list, we see the ancient city of Eridu could be approximately 420,000 years old, potentially the first city on earth. Just think about the implications and how it could dramatically alter our perceptions of history. Eridu was known as Earth Station 1 and was the location of Enki's famous Garden of Eden, which is located just southwest of the city of Ur, near the Euphrates River. So many consider the Garden of Eden to be simply a tall tale and nothing more than a fantasy. All across the world, we see statues and monuments that bear the symbol of the Trident and Caduceus together. Could they represent Enki Poseidon and his son Nishida? working closely together? A modern example of the symbols together is displayed in plain sight on a lamppost located in downtown Boston, Massachusetts. Also on the cornerstone of a Boston building, 
we see the caduceus and pineal or pine cone clearly positioned on the top. Finally, a crest portraying the earth globe with an eagle on top with a trident and caduceus is clearly shown together in downtown Boston's 12th post office square. A coin from Virgin Islands dated to circa 1905 shows the trident and caduceus linked by a sickle. Vancouver Island was a crown colony of British North America from 1849 to 1866, after which it was united with British Columbia. The United Colony joined the Canadian Confederation in 1871. Its flag depicts the trident and caduceus and pineal gland. Is this clear evidence of the Anunnaki being involved in early American and Canadian history? So much of the knowledge and understanding of who we really are is due to the bold sacrifices of a mere handful of brave researchers and archaeologists. History is written by the victors and the veil of truth about the Anunnaki origins and cultural influences are now being revealed. Do you have the courage to follow the evidence trail left for us? Join us again next episode as we venture into the deep jungles of Mesoamerica, encounter the great wizard kings of the Maya, and ponder the symbols and mysteries hidden in the realm of the winged serpent.